And it's because the um, the teaching is, since we're not on TV, the teaching just horseshit. It's terrible. People do not know how to teach this game. They do not. The, the guys giving lessons in general do not know how to teach it. And they're not helping people. And consequently, people are quitting because they're frustrated. This is the Vance Crow Podcast. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm glad you're here. Each week on this show, I sit across the table from an expert and I try and get them to open up about the discipline it took to gain the expertise, knowledge, and skill that they have. And this week, I sat across the table from a professional golfer named Jay Delsing. Jay is a fascinating guy. And before we sat down, I really had no idea just how difficult it is to become a professional golfer, what you have to go through and what it's like to be somebody that's in such a solo sport. As we go through this interview, you will hear about the inner workings of golf for a little while, but eventually we get to this point where we talk about how does one deal with the extraordinary pressure of having thousands of people watch you while you try and remain calm and hit a shot. And Jay has a great way of making golf relatable to people that, like me, aren't that interested in the sport. But by the time we get done, Jay and I talk about things like breathing exercises and meditation and the feeling and the experience of standing in front of a group of people and being able to perform at your very best. Jay was a heck of a lot of fun uh, to talk to, and you can tell right away that he is an expert at the radio. He's a commentator on Fox Sports, and he even has his own show on ESPN here in St. Louis called Golf with Jay Delsing. I hope you enjoy this episode, and buckle in, because it's an interesting one. Jay Delsing, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate being here. So, uh, I have to say that I've had uh, 12 people in all different sorts of domains, everything from dairy farmers to pharmacists, and I've never had somebody on that I knew as little about their field as I know about golf. And I, I got to tell you, I don't know, any, I, I had a pharmacist on, I don't know anything about that. That's how little I know about golf. So I am, I'm very interested to see how you can explain golf to me as though it, it makes any sense at all. Well, I'm not sure it makes sense in general, but... Uh you've had 12 on your 13th. I'm lucky number 13 person <laughs> is to be visiting here with you. And none of them are as lucky as I am uh, to, to be able to do what I do and to be able to enjoy uh, as much as I have the uh, profession that I have. I mean, I'm as lucky as I get. So, I mean, I think everyone knows kind of what golf is or has an image of it. But as a professional golfer, if you're going to describe to somebody that's never heard of the game of golf, how would you describe it to them? Um, Robin Williams has a great skit out. I don't know if you've seen it, but he describes um, one of uh, – it's a, a game where you're giving um, a set of clubs that are completely inappropriate to handle the task in front of you. You know, it's it's um, it's a strange sport where if you're a good athlete, you could pick up a tennis racket, Vance, and have a game with somebody. You know, you can chase the ball down, hit it over the net, and you can generally get it, you know. Golf's not like that. Because it's, it, it's counterintuitive on a lot of levels. One of the things I'll never forget, I was a young pro, just on tour, 23 years old, and Dr. J, I know much older than you are, but Julius Irvin was the preeminent NBA, and he came from the ABA basketball player on the planet. And I met him, and he was playing golf at the AT&T tournament up in Pebble Beach. And that's a tournament where they have celebrities and pros mixed together, and you have this team event. It's so cool. I had a great fortune of playing that thing like 26 times. So I meet Dr. J, and we go out on the range, and Vance, he can't hit a ball out of this room. (laughs) Now, we're talking about a guy that can jump completely out of the gym, can shoot a jump shot from 30 feet and just hit nothing but net, can do all of these incredible body control things in the air, all of these things, and can't hit a golf ball at all. And that was the very first time that I realized how hard golf is. So you were or are you right now are a professional golfer? You're still yeah, I still am. I'm I'm kind of quasi retired. I'm 58. There's a Champions Tour uh, on a uh, version of the PGA Tour, but I've only played. Uh, you t- you're qualified to play that once you turn 50. I've only played 15 events or so. I've had back surgeries. I had two surgeries on my foot last year. My body's kind of telling me, eh. 
just might be enough. So I miss the competitiveness of it, but my body's just not cooperating too much for me to play any longer. So the interesting thing about golf relative to almost all the other professional sports is that the professional sports, you get drafted into it. So you get done with college and somebody says, you know, on the 13th pick, we're going with that guy over there. With golf, it doesn't work that way. How does somebody become a professional golfer? What do you have to do to be able to be allowed to play? Yeah, well, basically you're an independent contractor. You know, we don't have teams. So what you're referring to is the team system. So the NBA, the NHL, MLB, you have the draft, and that's how players fill rosters. There is no roster, right? So think of it this way. Do them just a simple math. If you take the NFL as 53 guys on a team, there's what, 36 teams. The MLB has 32 teams, 25-man rosters. NHL, same thing. Okay, so you got all those kind of numbers. There's 125 professional golfers on the PGA Tour. At any given time, wow. That's it, per year. Okay. So our numbers are super small, super, super small. And um, what happens is, what it looks like now, Vance, is the college programs are highly developed now. Tiger Woods has turned the golf world upside down. So these guys can be farmers, and our friends listening can be nuclear physicist, but I guarantee you they've heard of Tiger Woods. Oh, yeah. I mean, of course. One of the biggest athletes of all time. Right. So Jack, Nicholas, and Arnold Palmer, and these these icons of the game, put the game on the map, so to speak. Tiger blew it up. Tiger made it cool. Tiger's really screwed up a lot of things as well. We can talk about all those if you want. They're not really that interesting, and they've been batted around till nauseam, really. But the fact that Tiger... In my opinion, one of the coolest things that I've experienced in my entire life, and he'll say this, that he considers himself multiracial. He considers himself African-American, and uh, his mom was Taiwanese. He considers himself multiracial. That's the coolest thing that's happened to our sport because for so long, just the color barrier in our country was, was alive and kicking. Golf is looked at as a rich kid sport. It's not true, but it's looked at it because people only think of country clubs and that's the only way to play. Not true. Not at all. Otherwise, I'd have never been playing, never had the opportunity to start. But Tiger brought in and opened so many doors that, that were closed for years and years. And I'm so delighted. I think it's long time coming. I think it's phenomenal. Not only in golf and any walk, whether, you know, I'm like I have four daughters, I'm extremely pro-female when it comes to equal pay for whether it's athletes or executives, male or female shouldn't matter. Your ability to do the job shouldn't matter. What color you are should never prohibit you from being allowed in this place or that place or or prohibited from even anticipating in something that you want to try. So you said something that, uh, that really resonates with me, that it is a rich man's sport. And as a, as a kid that grew up, um, you know, working jobs over the summer and, uh, and you know, do it, it just wasn't even in the cards. There was nobody that that ever you know. Let's me talk up and about say, it. Let's talk about sort of what kind of jobs did you have in the summer? Because I'll I'll compare mine to yours. Oh. I'm a hell of a lot older than you are. Um, so I uh, I detasseled and walked beans and baled hay, and then I uh, worked construction and uh, worked as a busboy, and then in college worked paving. So I was that's cool. Always running and gunning. So I started off uh, shoveling driveways when it was snowed, you know, for like a dollar. I started cutting grass. Back in the day with my own little 18-inch lawnmower with a bag on the back of it. So I had to keep the grass and dispose of it for like two bucks a yard. And I started caddying. So four hours on the golf course for seven bucks. I mean, so your jobs were probably more physically demanding. But, man, I was hustling, always trying to, you know. Who who exposed you to the game of golf? My dad. My dad was a professional baseball player, played in the big leagues for 10 years. Played professionally for 20 years, and he was um, he would go and play golf on a Sunday at this little muni up in North County. It's a dump. It was on the Mississippi River. It flooded every year, so it was stinky, and you know there was just all this garbage down there. And this place had a swimming pool. Where my I have three older sisters, younger brothers, from so the fourth of five, and my sisters and my mom were sun worshippers. Right, so here my little brother and I are just kind of dragged along, and there's this golf course hooked up to this thing. And my dad goes and plays there once a week or so, and I'm like, I'm not really that cool into swimming anymore. You know, I'm like 12 years old. I'd like to do something else. So I started jumping the fence and going over there and looking for golf balls, and I'd take my mom's clubs and whack them around, and just started playing. And um, 
uh, started saving my money so that I could, uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so that I could buy a membership into this place and play somewhere. And so I did that. And um, yeah, then I went and started caddying at a local course up in North County so that I could uh, get access to a better place. And, and then they, they hired me in the back room. So I was washing clubs and cleaning golf carts and schlepping stuff around for members. And then when I got off work, I got to play. And so I finally got to go to a course that had bunkers. The course, of course, I grew up on Vance didn't have any sand traps. It didn't have any. I mean, it was like if you had to drive down the fairway, the grass was like your the concrete in our driveways, you know, because the ball would just go forever. All of a sudden, I go to a place that's got grass. I'm like, man, this is weird, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, there were some uh, cool beginnings for me, you know. And when I hear people talk about it, a rich man's game, it's just they're just uninformed. And so, so talk about the first time you picked up clubs and swang them. Was it because you were 12? Was it easier or you had, I mean, because I've played golf a few times, yeah. but I would say that it is a humiliating experience at best. And yeah, particularly if sure. you're playing with anybody that has any kind of skill at all. We like to say now it's just a great excuse to drink and swear, you know, <laughs> so you could probably relate. But when you're 12, you know, so as you get older, you have all of these preconceived things in your mind that you should be able to do. You should be proficient at this. You should, that's garbage, really. When you're 12, you don't have those in mind. You just want to go, oh, maybe I can do this. Right. You know, and I don't even know if it's fun. I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if it's fun. I, and and I wasn't very good, but uh, I was good at every, every sport I ever played. And so this was appealing to me for one reason. It was solitary. I could be by myself and I didn't need the whole neighborhood to get together and play with me because I wanted something and nobody else wanted it. Oh, that's and super so, interesting. So the games, think about this. You got a great so, uh, baseball game going on and you know, you happen to you know, wrangled 10 or 12 kids together and your shortstop quits. Yeah, you know, there goes the your game. Your game hold. sucks. Yeah. You know, yeah. you're like, well, wait a minute. We Okay, so we move him in here. Now there's two outfield. You know, you, you do what you can do. But th- that just didn't appeal to me. You know, or somebody, you know, got hot. And wanted to quit. So this was all on me. You know, I could do whatever I wanted. I could, I could just wander around this place, stay out of trouble. I had no idea what trouble was really. Just... I was enjoying the fact that I was trying to get good at something. And so when did you start separating from, I mean, if you become a professional golfer, you were, you eventually separate from the pack on like, Hey, everybody's good, but yeah. Jay is really good. When did that yeah. happen? It started happening. So it took me about a year before I started getting good. A and I, I started, well, I mean, you got to understand though, I played a lot. Like okay. I, I played a lot. So having kids, I, I have, um, four daughters. My third daughter played division one volleyball. Okay. And having parented the other girls and watching them and their dispositions and their propensities to want to stay with something compared to her were like night and day. So that the others would be like, and the, the others were much more normal. The others would be like, let's go swing. Let's have a, let's have a popsicle. Let's play catch. Can I ride my bike? And can we, you know, like we go to the pool. And this one was like, can we play volleyball? And can we play volleyball? Okay. And so I was like, hmm. So that gave me some sort of glimpse as to what I, I, my biggest push was growing up with no money. I needed to get a scholarship to go to college because my parents couldn't pay. And I knew the family was under serious financial constraints and I didn't like it. Do you think I did not want, I did not want to be under that. I didn't want to have to go to my parents and go, um, hey, can you all pay for my college? So do you think most people in St. Louis know that that's your background? And the reason I ask is because, you know, as soon as I found out you and I were going to do this interview, I'm going around telling everybody and they're like, hey, did you know that his dad is a famous baseball player? So at least in my mind, I was thinking, well, this is why the rich kid got into baseball. Or in, oh, into dude, golf. let me tell you a great story about my dad. So my dad grew up in a dairy farm in Wisconsin. No kidding. He finished high school at night. He started playing baseball in C class. So, bro, they used to have C, B, A, single A, double A, triple A. Oh, man. A. So this was like you are starting on the not bottom even the rung. Minors, it's not yeah. even on the ladder yet. You, you know, you're working your way up to the bottom rung. So my dad gets brought up by the Yankees in 1949. He's a, he's a late season call-up, you know, when the rosters expand. So he comes in and he hits a couple home runs 
to help the Yankees overtake the Red Sox and win the pennant. It's a cool story, okay? There's some other cool things. I won't bore you with them. But anyway, so they win the World Series in 1949. I actually have my father's, my late father's 1949 Yankee World Series ring. It's cooler now. The next winter, a guy named Art Richmond, who's the GM for the New York Yankees in 19, this is now 1950, says to my dad, Jim, we want you to play for the Yankees next year. And my dad says, hell, Art, I want to play for the Yankees next year, too. And he says, <laughs> we'll pay you $5,000. Wow. And my dad says, is that negotiable? And he says, pretty much, take it or leave it. Wow. $5,000. So my dad never made any money. It's not baseball. You know, you think about baseball now, and it's but it's the game, it, the, the, the financial status of the players has gone insanely crazy. Back then, my, my dad, all the players – had jobs in the winter vans. Oh, so he was like a pl- when I my dad was so unhandy. When I think of my dad was a plumber. I'm like, I need to apologize for whoever whoever my dad's uh, whoever's house my dad worked on back then because my dad was a hammer and duct tape guy. That was it. So if he did plumbing, you're screwed. You know, hang on to it, change it, do something. But um, that's kind of how it was back then. My uh, my mentor, who is now a 99 year old guy that lives out in uh, New York City, but when he was coming up, he ran a department store called the Boston Store in Milwaukee. And one of the shticks that he had to get people in the store was um, during the summer times they would invite the Green Bay Packers down to sell ties because none of those guys had jobs if they weren't playing in the fall and the winter. They didn't have jobs. Can you so imagine? I, I, it's it's shocking, and so can when, you imagine Albert Pujols like selling yeah. used cars? <laughs> it, he I mean, owns a deal. He should own the dealership with yeah. the money he's made. Yeah. So totally when, different. When you were coming up in golf, did you know that there was a career there waiting for you, or you thought, "Hey, just get college paid for, and we'll see where this goes"? Oh man, all I wanted to do was be a professional athlete. All I wanted to do was be a professional athlete in something, and I didn't know if I was good enough. I had a million people tell me I wasn't. And that only inspired me. I'm one of those sort of people that if you tell me, you know, you can't jump that high, I'm going to try. That's just how I, my nature. And um, Were you playing other sports besides golf? Yeah, I played basketball, baseball. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't play both baseball and golf in high school. And that was probably a good thing, although baseball is my first true love. I still love it. I'm a box score guy. I still like to keep score when I go to the ball game. I love baseball. Uh, just a junkie. I still read about it. I still do everything about baseball but it was probably a good thing for me because I was playing so much golf and so little baseball we didn't have the developed um uh programs like they do now for the kids you know like they have select programs and all these elite sort of programs Vance and so for me it was church league ball and it was six games a summer and one week of one day of practice and I'm like this sucks man I need something else to do you know go out in the backyard and bang balls off the house and things like that. And, and you played golf too. then your high school had a team or how we did, did you? we were terrible. We were absolutely, I went to St. Louis U high. My parents loved the Jesuits. I didn't have a choice. They, my, I remember one Saturday, all my friends went to either Rosary or Riverview. I grew up in a little place called Glasgow village up in North County. And I can remember my dad saying, um, get your clothes on. We're going to take a test. I'm like, test. What are you talking about? I don't, first of all, I don't, you know, I didn't study for any tests because get in the car. You know, just get in the car. So go down there, take this test, and I get into the U High. And so I went to St. Louis U High, and um, it was a great experience. I, I, I loved it. Our our golf team was terrible. Uh, Father Bailey was our coach. He went on to be the president of DeSmet High School here, another Jesuit high school, and um, became a good friend of mine. But it was kind of like we'd all get together in a little room and go, well, if you guys want to go have a practice, you know, go ahead and – uh, I remember as a freshman going out my first day of the qualifying, and I shot 76, and I was so disappointed. I'd made that. I, and that doesn't mean anything to yeah, me. Yeah, so, so even that... par is 72. Okay. And if you're a, it's a scratch golfer, which is um, – so let me tell you this. Uh, 1% of everybody that plays golf can break 80. Okay. Okay. So I was uh, – what was I, 14 as a freshman, and I shot And you're doing 76, this – you're in the top 1% at, four, at 14. I didn't know any of those numbers, by the way, at that age. But, I mean, so I went out, and I had made some bogeys coming in. I shot – you know, 76, I thought, oh, man, this is this is not going to be good. You know, I'm a freshman. I got all these upperclassmen. I was low on the team by like 10. Oh, That's yeah. That's about our team was stinky. We actually probably had to improve to be stinky. We were worse than stinky. I don't know what. I don't want to swear on you. So, uh, well, this is, yeah, it's, no, a, it's not for broadcast. Yeah. Uh, so 
when when uh, how did you get spotted in order to be able to get a scholarship to go to to go to college? Well, so play? there's tournaments, little there's national tournaments that you try to qualify for. There's the United States Amateur. There's all the, you know the United States Golf Association is the uh, governing body of the game in the world, along with the RNA, the Royal and Ancient. So the game was created in Scotland and and um, England, and uh, so the Royal and Ancient is the governing body there, and the United States Golf Association is the uh, governing body here, and they kind of get together. They run championships all the time, the U.S. Open, you know, always wanted to be a national Open champ, would love to be able to say I, I won the championship for my country, you know, something like that. So I played in four of those U.S. amateurs when I was um, a kid. Those were mostly after – one of them was I, – I qualified for my first one, I think, when I was a junior in high school. And then I played uh, three more of them um, throughout college and stuff like that. But I almost won the United States Junior uh, Championship when I was like 16. I finished – I think I, I don't know if I lost in the semifinals or the quarterfinals, but I lost to the guy that won the tournament – and we went to like extra holes and it was really close and he just nudged me out. And I, uh, so th- that's how you pretty much got recognition back then. Remember, no internet. It's so weird to think that there was no internet, but there was no internet, no cell phones. I sent out resumes. I sent out 250 resumes that I put together of myself to all these colleges that I wanted to go to. Any place that was like south of Memphis that I sent, I sent a packet of myself to the uh, college coaches. And so then you you get into college and uh, and now you have good coaching. You have people. No, that can... no, we didn't really have good coaching. We had a a, a, a figurehead that was good. His name was Eddie Merritt's little pro, and he was very uh, very good at what he did. He um, he helped us raise some money. We had great awareness in L.A. We played great courses. I probably played on maybe the best college golf team ever with the guys that I played with. The one on Corey Pavin, Steve Pate, Duffy Waldorf, Tom Bernice, and I all played together. Um, they've all gone on to have fabulous tour careers, much better than mine, won majors, things like that. Uh, we all played together in college. And, um, you know, the college experience was awesome. I was a young guy from North County going out to L.A. I was a huge UCLA uh, sports fan. Uh, the year I went out there was the year that John Wooden retired. So my senior year in high school, G- Coach Wooden retired. But Coach Wooden would come and talk to the golf team once every six weeks. We'd sit on the, sit on the floor of the, of the golf shop and coach Wooden would sit there and talk to us And Vance, By the time we were like juniors, we're like, can you believe we got to go listen to coach Wooden again? Can you believe <laughs> yeah. I mean, dump? my dad has books of, of just his quotes, right? Oh, just, I yeah. know. I know. Be quick, but don't hurry. I mean, I know all those things. And, um, so it was just a, a kind of a dream come true. I got this scholarship, everything paid for, got, went out to LA. We had a great, I had a great college experience. I was a two-time All-American. I graduated in four years. I got my degree. Everything was really, really cool. And then the next year I got on the PGA Tour and I thought I was... Right out of college, PGA yeah, Tour. Okay. I thought I was really hot stuff and I thought I was really good until I saw all these other players that were just really good too. So it was, it was cool to be able to tee it up with people you watched on TV as kids, like Tom Watson and Arnold Palmer. I got to play with all those guys. It was, it was, like I said, so fortunate. So I was doing a little bit of reading before you came over and about how you become a professional golfer. And there's, you were saying, you know, 125 guys have their tour card. How, and to talk a little bit about that. How do you get your yeah. tour card? And then what does it mean once you have it? Yeah. So back in the day, there's a, the, there was a little different on how you get in. Now that you go through the web.com, they just, it's called a corn fairy tour. Now they just changed the umbrella sponsorships. That's kind of the developmental tour that helps you get onto the PGA Tour now. There was none of that back when I played. It was, you went through one qualifying school tournament, and if you finished in the top, whatever it was at the time, you got a tour card that got you access to the tour the next year. Okay. And that's the only way. So, man, you had a six-round tournament at the, that was the most pressure you've ever felt in your life because you're playing for the entire next year of your life. You know, so you're coming down the stretch and going, I mean, I've never felt more nervous and crazy in my life in some of those qualifying school tournaments but I had a really good record in the qualifying school tournament I went through it several times made it through it so if you go on tour and stay in the top 125 you don't have to go back through the qualifying school if you fall out of the top 125 and have a bad year then you got to go back and if whenever I fell out of it and I went back I always got my card back again until I was like in my late 40s so it was it was pretty cool I probably played 
shoot, I don't know, 25 years in a row or something like that. 20 My years God. in a row, something like that. It was I played in between uh, the web.com and the regular tour, easily over a thousand events and just, um, yeah, really, um, just really cool stuff. Got to play with the best players in the world, worked on trying to be the best player in the world and it never happened for me, but it was, you know, when you sit back, one day you're going to sit on the porch and, you know, you might be drooling a little on yourself. You have your buddy come over and you're, you're just going to talk about some of the things that you were able to experience. And you no, know, I didn't win the Masters. I was never the number one player in the world or anything, but I, I went for it and I went after it and I got what I got. And I'm, you know, would I have liked to have done better? Oh, hell yeah. But if you'd have gave, gave, given me a piece of paper when I was 14 and said, here's what you're going to get, would you take this? I'd be like, yeah. Oh, I mean, just give the, it to me. the millions and millions of people that would dream of playing in one round of what you've done yeah. for 25 years. Yeah. So um, talk a little bit about uh, how you see the game of golf as far as like you wake up in the morning and you're like, I'm going to go play a game of golf. I played this morning. Okay. It's 90. 95 out. So it's great. So this is Love work it. for you or this is you got a stretch and you know, you've, you've got your, something I did, my, I did my lifting this morning. So I go to the gym, I do my exercises. Cause I just want to do that. Really. It's been force of habit now just because of, so we could backtrack a little bit. Tiger changed the way the game's played. It'll change the way it'll be played forever. We never lifted any sort of weights before. Excuse me. And he comes out and is a spindly little kid that hits the ball miles and in the first three years decides he's going to start lifting weights. And we were always taught if you lifted weights, you're going to screw up your swing. And before you know it, he transforms his body and has turned this game into a power smash mouth game instead of this finessey little – most people were built like I am kind of – Thin, either really thin or kind of chubby and overweight and soft. And um, now you look at the athletes that are playing the PGA Tour, and uh, and they're all ripped. Ninety eight percent of them are ripped. They've got sports specific uh, exercises. It's like anything, Vance. When you bring this sort of money and attention and the corporate sponsors into the game that Tiger did, all of these fabulous other things offshoot from there. Okay, so now we have a metric system. On, on how to judge things in golf. We have these phenomenal high-speed computers and cameras that can capture your golf swing and break it down into nanoseconds. And it wasn't until about five years ago that they really started getting developed. And, a, and those cameras dispelled all the things I was taught about how to play. We were taught raw, incorrectly. We were the, the basic fundamentals of how to swing. Like if we wanted the ball to start further out to the right, we were taught just swing further out to the right. But no one taught us that if we swing out to the right and this is the ball and you swing out to the right, but the club face is pointing left, the ball's going to go where the club face is pointing. So I got a little far from the microphone there. But it's just it never dawned on anybody to think like that. It was always about the swing instead of the, you know, the ball bat sort of mentality. And all these things are happening with these computers because they can slow down the frames and you can see the contact. You can watch the contact. You can see what's actually happening instead of these cameras that are just blurred because we can swing the club so fast and they can't capture it. Well, now they can capture all that stuff. Everybody on tour now travels with something called a track man. It's a little $25,000 computer that they travel with fans and they stick it out on the ground and they swing and it just spews back information. How their club head speed, their ball head speed, their launch no angles, kidding. side spin, this is that. It's it's fascinating. Well, well that, that, but, that actually brings up a good question, which is, you know, as soon as somebody starts to get into golf, they go to the golf store and there are golf clubs of all different price ranges. And yep. you could go to play it again sports and buy some used clubs, or you could go buy the, I'm sure, $10,000 clubs. I, I don't even know what's yeah, out that's, there. Yeah, that's a high. There is a, a group called PXG out now that's got maybe ten grand, but that'd be the upper range. In, in any case, yeah, you can right, go out right. and buy the, the Cadillac or the BMW clubs. Yeah. How much does that – so for a guy like you, you really know the game. You've played for a long time. Yep. If you are given great clubs or well-fitting – you know, cheap clubs, how many, how much is that going to impact your game? 
Oh, man. Uh, the biggest thing's got to be the shaft for me because the shaft is the way the club flexes, and that's going to help me, you know, feel where and how I'm going to hit the ball. I could probably hit the old ones do just fine. Most people, I would say, can't. Because with the old ones, you'll have a sweet spot that's much smaller. But, you know, without sounding like a dick, I can hit that sweet spot, and most people can't. You know, and what the other the modern day clubs have made the 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 surfaces bigger targets, so their off center uh, hits and misses, um, you know, are corrected. And so, for anybody that's starting, I would say buy the Cadillac version in a used version, slightly gently used version, because it makes a huge difference. Makes it way easier. Trust me. So when you're ready to play, you're going to call me, and I'm going to help you find the right set of clubs. And, and, and your wife, too, and whoever, do, whomever else. And what about uh, golf balls? Are expensive golf balls uh, worth uh, it? I wouldn't worry about it right now. They've, 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 they've leveled the field on some of those. So I, I play the Titleist Pro Vs, and those are the most expensive ones, but I've been on a Titleist staff my whole career, so I actually get paid to play those which is a great deal because if I had to pay for golf balls, I might quit because I don't think that I don't think my wallet would come out of my pocket. But what, for you, what is the difference between different it's just golf feel, balls? It's just some feels. It's just feels a lot. So what, where it's, where it's going to, where the rubber meets the road on something like this is how much speed you have. Okay. So speed is going to, speed is power. Okay. You can have a lot of speed and if you, you know, it's kind of like a fast car. If you have a real fast car, but you can't keep it on the track, it's not that good. But for someone that's starting, if you have speed, you got a really good chance to really have fun with the game because we'll get, I could get you to connect and, ha and hit a ball like you just – you will feel absolutely nothing when you hit this ball beautifully and you watch it fly a mile and you're like, how the hell did I do that? And how the hell do I do that again? And that happened to me when I was like 13. I hit a shot and it just went right where I wanted to, right at the flag stick, almost in the hole. And I was like, I'm done. I'm done, man. I got this. This thing's got a hold of me. It's not letting go. I'm so fortunate that it didn't let go. So, you know, you were talking about how golf is a solitary game. You know, you went out there and, and uh, you got to play it by yourself. And you can play it with groups, though. In fact, you take people around on yeah. tours. And, and we were talking about this uh, before about how this is actually a great way to get to know people. Uh, is by playing golf with them. So whenever I pray for anything, I don't, I, 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 I'll miss anything subtle. I need to be run over with it, smacked upside the head so I can pay attention to it. And when I saw the, um, the, pro, the pro-am format, so professionals and amateurs get together every week on tour and, the, and probably somewhere around 50 to 60 of the pros that are in a typical 150-man field get paired with some amateurs and they go out and play. So Theoretically, you can go play with Tiger Woods the day before he's going to compete in a championship on the PGA Tour. First of all, that's a differentiator from our sports and any others. Yeah, the, you it's don't get to go shoot ever. hoops with Michael Jordan. Yes, yeah, like Michael, the Bulls if we go have a little one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one, you know, he's like, yeah, why would I do that? Right. You know, um, but th that that's what's so cool about it. So they don't necessarily play the same set of tees we play, so they're not back as far. But it doesn't matter. You're still putting into the same hole. But the 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 cool thing is, is. Um, if you look at the, first of all, look at the golf demographic, it rocks. And if you look at our corporate sponsors on the PGA Tour, it's basically the who's who of so many different spaces in this country and, and different markets. It's, you know, ridiculous. FedEx is a, has a FedEx Cup point standing, a year-long point cup standing race for the PGA Tour players. The top guy gets 15 million bucks. Okay, Tiger Woods effect, right? Back in the day, we didn't even have anything like that. And our purses were so small, it, it, was, it was crazy. Then you also have like Coca-Cola. You have um, uh, all the car companies, Mercedes-Benz. You have Rolex. You have Omega watches. You have great watch companies. You have, just, just name them, the car companies, the, the financial institutions. You'll, you, you've got them all because, the, the, first of all, the, the golfer, for the most part, is the ideal sort of athlete. They're a little more educated. They usually handle themselves better, and they don't get themselves. You're not seeing a whole hell of a lot of golfers on the police reports. <laughs> you know, they're coming down the, you know, the the pike on ESPN. And um, I know that sounds crazy, but I mean that's it's that's safe also, money for corporations. It's also too, true. And you also then think of advances. Um, um, the guys that play golf, 
you know, have some expendable income. So if you're going to try to sell your product, you know, it's probably going to fit over here. They're going to have the opportunity to purchase that. And so the demographics are beautiful. And what I love about the game is it's introduced me to phenomenal people. Uh, my business, I started my business in 92, uh, where I started, um, I started annihilating business cards when I was, uh, when I was 23, I had my, had my own business card made. I had my own, uh, really well done. I spent way more money than I ever thought I'd ever spend on paper, you know, stationary and note cards so that I could write these handwritten notes to people that I played with so that I could start developing this network and this friendships. It was basically friendships. And so I'd write these guys and put my business card in there. They'd send theirs back through the mail. We didn't have the internet yet. And we, they started asking me to do things for them. Hey, my company's got this. Will you do that? Hey, can you come in here? And what can we do that'll be fun? Maybe we can raise some money for this charity. This is, and that's another component that just rocks about the tour is charity. We'll get to that later. But the, the fact that um, the, I made these friendships through the game, they're lifelong friendships. And look, I shoot what I shoot. They could shoot 150. I don't care. It's never a thing. It's never about the quality of the golf that's played. It's the quality of the person that's playing. And I've said that my entire life. I go, look, if you're not a jerk, I'll hang out here with you. You can shoot 200. I don't care. I have a, I have a good friend and a mentor named Forrest Langenfeld. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he's a banker. And he told me one of the best uh, parts about his not-so-great golf game is that he gets to go out uh, golfing with CEOs that are also not very good, and they don't feel embarrassed around him. And I was like, Forrest, that's pretty clever. Right. Well, it's it, it's look, it's a humbling game, and it's a hard game. And you learn a lot about people in playing just nine holes with them. What would you say you learn from people? Oh, you learn how they handle adversity. You learn how they handle what would be looked at as, in not to me, but what they look like it might be embarrassing. You look at how they play by the rules or don't play by the rules. You look at how you look at a lot of different things. You also look at how they interact. Do they talk down to you because they're the CEO? Do they, you know, you learn a lot about that. What would you say, uh, how much has cell phones changed golf from when there were no cell phones? I think it's changed life. Really? I think it's, oh, for sure. It, and not for the better. Okay. We are not better. Let me put, let's put it that way. In terms of communication, we are not better communicators. Okay. We just have more venues. We have more opportunities to communicate. It's given people platforms to be assholes and take no responsibility. Like, I can say whatever I want to you via Twitter, but not look you in the eye like I'm looking you in the eye right now. Right. And it's given anybody a platform, which I guess in general you'd say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's brought out an entire vile, nasty side of humanity that was probably always there, but now it's just continually rubbed in our face. Look at yeah, our president. I mean, I feel like I feel like um, one of the things we, we were when we, when we first started thinking about how great the internet would be, and this is definitely not my idea. I heard it on a on a podcast on the, of the Long Now, and essentially the guy was saying we all thought that by connecting everybody, all these great things would happen, and a lot of great things did happen. But yes. we also had no idea of what happens when you connect immediate instantaneous grotesque thoughts or anger or and 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 so the no one predicted this and now kind of in hindsight it's a little bit like well of course people are going to be you know shady to each other and and do all these weird things but it was definitely not i mean when we were learning about what the internet was going to do no no one talked about this well it's kind of that's it's kind of the other side of human nature isn't it you know we all have those you know we all need to be disciplined we all need to you know mind our manners, so to speak. But this thing, you can be sitting in your lounge chair, you know, drinking beer and see something on TV and not like it and yell something at that person. Really? What? I mean, does that make us better? I don't know. I don't think so. Do you I, think, I don't think, do you think social media has changed the game of golf? Oh, it definitely has. It's made, it's made the players more popular. It's uh, brought different components in there. It's made them more money. All the things that there's, there's a lot of, I am not a social media lover. I would rather do without it. Um, you know, I have this 
golf show on the radio. So I've hired a social media company and they've done a great job, but I don't want to spend my time doing stuff like that. Like, I don't want to tell, I would much rather you and I go hang out and have a couple of beers and be anonymous and me take a picture of the beer. And now I'm going to drink this beer and now I'm going to go, you know, who cares? Why would someone be that interested in what I'm going to do? And I, why would I want to tell them? I'd much rather fly under the radar than be in the eye as much as some others. So I remember in baseball when uh, people started taking steroids and uh, home runs went through yep. the roof. McGuire, Sammy Sosa. Does, that does golf have that same kind of controversial issues if they had things like that where people played the game? We have drug testing, but we've we've only had a couple guys suspended and it was all for innocent, like um, tainted um, supplements or something like that. Yeah. So it never took off in the same way that it did? In- no, because that that's not... You, the guys are big, but you don't need that that kind of bulk for golf. That's not what we're looking for. You just want to be – like Brooks Kepka is the number one player in the world right now, and he's pretty big in the upper body, but he's you need to stay flexible more than you need to stay bulked. So are you doing yoga then too? Or I've done you- yoga. I've done – you name it, man. I've tried it. I've tried Pilates, anything to try to stay flexible and try to keep my body in there. Yeah, I've tried it all. I've – I'm pretty open to that kind of stuff. Are you a superstitious guy? My, I came from a family that was really superstitious, and I had to get rid of those things. Like I couldn't remember. Like I can remember one time where after I made a putt, I'm like, "Oh man, did I mark that with a heads up or a heads down quarter?" You know, and, and I running through these mental gymnastics in my mind before the next putt, and I'm like, "Dude, just get up there and make the putt. <laughs> Forget about what the coin is." So. My family was crazy and still is crazy superstitious. Like, like if the Cardinals were winning and they weren't watching, they wouldn't turn it on. And I'm like, that has nothing to do with anything. Nothing. And they're like, no, we're not doing it. Yeah, it makes you. And feel, I'm like, I'm doing it. It makes you feel really uh, powerful, really important as a, <laughs> yeah. as a component, which of is ridiculous, you know, because you have no control. It makes no difference. What do you think the superstition was from? Did it come from religious background? Oh, or both. Just as we a- had a really strange. My family had a real strange sport re- religion uh, kind of intertwined thinking, where like, like I can remember when I was a kid, I was walking to church on Saturday morning before my soccer game because my mom had me convinced, you know, that if I went to church, I was going to win. You know, and it wasn't until I started thinking like, well, doesn't God like the other team too? You know, I'm like, well, of course he does. If it's, you know, so yeah, I, I, I had that just drilled into me when I was younger and I, I rebelled against that. Like what else, what else would happen with superstition? Oh man. I mean, just like, do you have uh like carry a rosary in your pocket or carry like a uh, something in your golf bag or like, you know, and I'd be like, where is it? You know, is it, is, do I have a cross in my pocket? Did I rub it before I hit that drive? You know, all this stuff that just makes you nuts. That doesn't even matter. Yeah. I remember, uh, first being exposed to, uh, prayer cards, you oh, know, yeah. and, and thinking like, you know, making the equivalence of of uh, of them to being like baseball cards. I didn't understand, and you know, like, do people put you know? You find out people put these in their pocket yeah. and they carry it around. We and gotta really trade this. Gonna... I'll trade your Mary card for a Joseph <laughs> card. Yeah, yeah. I um, man, that's just the for me. That's the that's the kind of bad side of religion. It's uh, that's a that's a topic we could talk about for a long time. But I just feel like um, you've got to get comfortable with your version of God and, and the universe and whatever that looks like for you and um, and try to, for me, to try to stay away from all the dogma and all the man-made stuff that just makes it so confusing. And so if you jump through this hoop, you're going to get this. If you give us this amount of money, you're going to get that. I mean, that is just a, such a bad way to go. That's what I was, my whole life, young life was just, that with religion and it was just it's a gigantic turnoff like i like the idea of someone saying they're blessed i can't stand an athlete saying i'm blessed it's just so overdone you know it's just so over it, it's just overdone for me and there must be it might, particularly a game like golf where you're talking about the you know millimeter difference in the way you hold your shoulder yeah, right. having the such ball a big bouncing in- across the ground vance i mean there's so much chance involved in all of it you know. How do you feel about playing a game where skill is a huge part of it, but chance? I think that's really a, a huge part of all sport is chance, luck, bounces, you know, 
we like to think that we've trained so hard that we're computers and that we're, we've been proven that our brains are stronger and smarter than the best computer made and all this stuff, but we're not a machine. We're human and we have, you know, we have senses and we have feelings and intuitions and things like that and they change all the time. And then we're playing a sport that's outside and, and all the elements that are changing every minute. You get a little gust of wind, it blows the ball, it doesn't blow the ball. You thought it would push it to the left, it pushed it to the right. You hit a, uh, a blade of grass that wasn't cut by the mower and the ball went a little offline and you're like, my putting sucks. Your putting really probably doesn't suck. It just, you know, there's so much chance it goes into it that it's not going to... That happened. The biggest challenge through all that, bud, is to try to keep a positive outlook and try to keep and, and think that the next one's going to be okay. I, uh, I've had a chance so, to speak at some of the best turf programs in the United States. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the largest agricultural product we make in the United States is grass. Right. And in particular, there's some really amazing programs down in, uh, in, uh, Auburn and uh, at, at North Carolina State University, yep. and it was fascinating to me how much the world of even mower blades, you know, matter or breeding for for grass, like right. it's mind blowing. Well, how about this? The USGA is working on our biggest challenge for golf as we move into the future is water. Mm. We got to keep building these golf courses, and how, what what are we going to do with the water situation? We give it more and more people on the planet. It's a problem. The USGA is working, and, and we've got a, the PGA Tour is working on different blades of grasses that only need to be watered once a week. You know, and for whatever reason, if you go look at golf the way it was, like the British Open is this week. It's great. I don't know if you watched it at all. I know you probably haven't. If you're looking at me like, what? And, um, but it's on, and if it's If my cool. father-in-law is watching golf, I'll watch it with him. He's yeah. probably the only person on the yeah. planet I'll sit around and I watch bet he, I bet he is. You've got to have to go <laughs> over to his house. But anyways, it comes on in the morning. It comes on like 6 in the morning. It's on all day, right? Um, and you look at the golf courses over there, and they're not green like ours. It's just a different, whole different landscape. Because they found the land and built the course, and they generally leave the land as it is, as it was. And if it's rained a lot this year, then the course might be green. If it hasn't, it's going to look brown like a cracker. But over here, we think brown's ugly. So we just dump water on it and water it and water it more. And, do, you know, and, and so... We've gotten some of the aesthetics that we have over here are beautiful, but it gets a little crazy. So let's talk a little bit about charity and what the PGA Tour does for charities. Sure. So yeah. the PGA Tour is a 501c3, has a 501c3 arm to it, which means, you know, it's a non-for-profit. It also has a, it also is a for-profit entity. Okay, so it's a gigantic organization. Now there's well, like 3,000 people who work for the tour. And when, when I started, there were like, 40. Right. <laughs> so it's just grown exponentially. But what's cool about it, so, so um, a tournament comes to town. Let's take the Phoenix Open, the Waste Management Open. You may or may not be aware of this, but the 16th hole at the Phoenix Open is where they have in, they've totally enclosed the entire par three and made it like a stadium. So now there's bleachers all the way around this hole. That's, it's a football field. The hole is... 152 yards long. It's longer than a football field. There are people around there. That, there's like 200,000 people around there. Oh, wow. And it is so cool. Um, I made a hole-in-one there one year. Oh, man. I was just going to ask you. Uh, yeah. have you I made a lot of hole-in-ones, but I, I made a hole-in-one there in front of all those people. And, um, oh, man, the biggest roar I've ever had in my life. Kind of a funny story goes with it. This is how cheesy the, the old PGA Tour was. So all these people are yelling and screaming. It's a great experience. And on the tee is a car. And, my, and this is on a Saturday. And my caddy goes, dude, I think you want a car. I'm like, he goes, can I have it? I go, hell no, you can't have a car. What are you talking about? Just, no, you can't have the car. So we're walking in the car. We're, we're facing this way. And the car is like sitting on the tee facing the way we're walking. And as we get to the front of the car, there's a little placard on it that says Sunday only. Oh, oh. <laughs> nowadays, if you make a hole in one, they, 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 you know, they give you cars and all sorts of cool things. But the, um, so the tournaments have changed dramatically, but this event down in Scottsdale is unbelievable on a lot of different levels. First of all, it's entertainment. People come there at the parties and the, the bands and stuff that, that show up uh, after play and everything. Legendary. 
legendary. The other thing that's cool is all the monies that are created that week and that tournament gets split 50-50. The for-profit arm of the tour takes 50%, and they leave the other 50% for the local charities that are involved, for the local host organization that runs that event. How much money do you think that tournament raised last year for the local? They raised like 18 million bucks. Oh, my gosh. I was thinking like two. 18 million wow. bucks. Wow. Now, that's significant money when you multiply that by 10 years or, or 15 years. You know, you're building hospitals and you're doing, you're, you're doing some great things for, for kids and charities. So changing the subject, but I'm, yeah. I'm interested in the discipline of golf. W- one of the things that I looked in your record is that you played over 5,000 games, is that, or matches uh, oh, professionally? Uh, oh, uh, no. I, um, so did you look on my website? I, I'm, I'm trying to – I think it was so on your one Wikipedia of the things, page. Okay, yeah. so one of the things I did on my website was try to go, um, what can I put on there that's kind of interesting and unusual? which might fit into this show. And I was hanging out with my daughters and they, dad, how much have you walked in your life? And I'm like, whoa, because we walked all through college, all through high school. So we took it just from when I turned pro and we were, we last counted, and it hasn't been updated in like five years at 55,000 miles. Wow. I've walked. No wonder my feet are so sore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, that really no, would have I mean, an impact. How many, how many matches have you played in? Uh, I have played 500, 500. 570 or something. If, and if you combine the other PGA Tour components, it's probably 1,000, over 1,000. And those are four days usually? Yeah, if you make the cut, they're four days. Yeah. And so how in the world does somebody stay present and alert so that's, that, that many times? So that's a cool thing. So most people think, Vance, that when you go out and play around the golf, you have to be there for the entire moment. Like, like... From the time you start on the first tee to the time you're walking off the 18th, you got to be concentrating. And it's not like that at all. It's a series of ins and outs. Here I am. I'm getting ready to hit this shot on the first tee. Okay, I, I got to run through my stuff. What club am I going to hit? What shot do I see? What can I commit to? I have to commit to it. Then I go through my pre shot routine and then I hit. And then comes the real challenge. Now I got to accept what I just did and then go find this thing and do it again and then do it again and do it again, and go in and out. And in the interim, try to stay present and focused and positive because I just fouled one off into the people, and now I got this horrible lie, and I got, and I got to stay positive because I've got a lot of golf left to play. And what have you learned about being able to stay positive? I wasn't very good at it when I was younger. Uh, I Actually, I wasn't bad about staying positive. It, it's just um, I... I was too emotional at the time about certain things. You know, I would, I would get too easily frazzled when I was younger and think like, even if the good stuff was happening, if it was going good, I was thinking this is, you know, going to never end. And when it was bad, this is never going to end. You know what I mean? And it was, you're only a couple swings and a couple fields away from turning it around, you know? And um, also I learned in a big way that it's not that important. None of it. It's really cool. I love what I do, but it's not that important. And what 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 did become important to you? Oh man, my daughters, uh, being a good dad, uh, uh, being a good human being, trying to make this planet better, um, trying to share the stuff that I've been gifted with, or experiences that I've been able to have to try to try to pass that along to somebody else so that they can keep it going after I'm gone. What is, uh, you know, you had such a long career in golf. What is something that you wish you would have known earlier or or a change that you wish you would have made? Like, man, I wish I would have realized that this was a sacrifice worth making earlier. Yeah, I would, it would have been what I wouldn't have done. I would not have changed my golf swing like I did. I, I just had a feeling that I couldn't hit it well enough. And I, I was, when I was good, I was extremely good. When I was bad, I was awful. What I would have done is worked on my short game because that would have lowered my scores and kept it in there and left my long game alone. That's what I would have done. I and wouldn't have hurt myself as much either because I wound up hitting so many balls trying to change my swing and groove this other motion that I just kind of beat my body into the ground. How, how far into your career did you do that? I did it twice. 
Oh wow! I'm not a smart man. I did. I, did I mean, that's twice. like trying to pivot your business model or something. Yeah, it I mean, is. Well, well, the, when you, you got to understand, in our generation, we didn't even have videos. I mean, when I watched, when I grew up with TV on, bud, we had four channels. Okay, so one of the things that the kids have tremendous advantages over is they get to watch everything on TV, and then now they can YouTube them, they can Google them, you can, you know, you can pull up and slow, you know watch frame by frame on what, you know, how Michael Jordan shoots a free throw. And you can break down his leg motion. You can break down every, you can get as specific as you want. We didn't have any of that stuff. We wouldn't even have video for the first, you know, until like the 90s. And it was so oh, archaic compared to what it is now. So we were just basically going by feel and what we were feeling and trying to judge what we felt by the way the ball was reacting and try to get it to work. I mean, there's this really cool thing. Ben Hogan, who was one of the giants of the game and just legendary practicer and ball striker and things like that, uh, I can remember when video came out. And the guy said to him, Mr. Hogan, do you want me to take a video of your swing and show you what it looks like? And he goes, hell no. And he goes, why not? He goes, because I don't want to see on there that I'm not doing what I feel like I am doing. So there's a saying on tour events that what you feel ain't real. But if you feel like you're doing something and it's working, you stay with it. Okay? And that's where the, you know, the train can fall off the track because you can feel like you're doing something and it's not working. You might not even be doing what you think you're doing. Do you, did you find that when you were in the middle of your career that you would – I mean, even maybe in the beginning of your career, you must be getting lots of advice – yeah, I mean, but I, I learned at an early age to disregard that. I mean, so many people told me when I was a kid, you're never going to make it. So I was like, I don't really care what you think. But I was always interested in trying to get better. I was always interested in trying to get better. And I, I didn't really know how to do that. I didn't come from a family that was analytical at all. We were all feel-oriented. And it was almost like, ah, just play better. Okay, how do I do that? You know, give me some, give me some, uh, give me a plan. Let me put a plan together and figure out what, you know, break this thing down and help me figure out how to do that. And it wasn't until I got older, you know, we, sports psychology came into the, to the mix. So like after my third year, I realized every damn guy on tour had a sports psychologist except me, you know, and just so the guy just helping him try to break it down and to keep it simple and help, you know, keep your wits about you and give you some, give you some guideposts to help you along the way. And I was like, oh, man, I didn't know that was going on either. Did you get one? Oh, yeah. And how did it help? Helped a lot. Bob Rattel, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's, the, he's world-renowned in golf. He's the number one sports psychologist for sure. He's a friend of mine. He wrote two books, and I got a chapter in one of his books where I kind of tried to blow his mind psychology-wise, but it didn't work. So, so, so tell me, what was, in the, what was in the chapter? It's really just about trying to trust yourself try to keep it really, really simple. And I was having an awful year and I went down to Memphis for this tournament. And I, with, with the exception of, a, I hit a golf cart and had my ball go under the tree on my 17th hole the last day, I, I probably would have won this tournament. I wound up finishing second, but it was still, I still kept, you know, even as bad as my year had been at the time, I still kept believing I was going to win and I still kept going and it was a blast. It was really, really fun. What do you think is, uh, going on in the game today that you did not expect? I mean, you've talked about the technology and the players are bigger than they used to be or more muscular, but have other things changed? The biggest thing, I would never force, would, would have foreseen the money getting as big as it is with Tiger. And so what's happened now, bud, is we are getting great athletes playing golf because you can look at, like I said, I'm 58. I'm still involved in the game. You know, what other sports could, is that like? You can have an extremely long career, and now you can really make money. Or maybe not as much as some of the other sports, but, you know, Tiger Woods is a billionaire. So there's not that many other billionaires that play the other sports. Now, he's a generational or a, maybe a two-generational type athlete. You know, people like him don't come around very often. But still, his impact on the game. I guess that's the coolest thing that I got to play. And, and it was kind of the tail end of my career, but I still got to play with Tiger and play in that era and got to see that and watch it and watch the people and watch the explosion of the, of the corporate sponsorships of the golf courses. Because change, you were there the, before and then, and yeah, then after. Right. And watch, watch the way, you know, when we were playing, there were metal bleachers and ropes up and things like that. Now we've got air conditioned sky boxes that are five levels, uh, 
tall and we've got people coming in on helicopters to watch it and we've got I mean it's just the explosion the thing has just gone like this Vance in terms of of finding people finding creative ways to either entertain or watch or experience the golf tournaments either on TV or online or in person it's just mushroomed like crazy so I never expected so the that. money has increased are the numbers increasing are more people playing golf that's a great question. Right now, we're in a really strange time. We're in a flat um, area of progression where we're getting about 2 million people a year coming in and about 2 million a year quitting. And it's because the um, the teaching is, since we're not on TV, the teaching just horseshit. It's terrible. People do not know how to teach this game. They do not. The, the guys giving lessons in general do not know how to teach it. And they're not helping people. And consequently, people are quitting because they're frustrated. Okay, so uh, this is so interesting. Why? Yeah. What do you mean? that you, Why, why they don't, is it so they, bad? They, they, they don't know what to tell these folks to get them to hit the ball better. They don't know what to tell them. They literally don't. And so they maybe themselves be good golfers, but then when it comes out to, to getting out on the course, or no, they're not, not necessarily even... not, not, no, it's not, it's not like that. And, and, you know, we got the golf channel on and, and it, in itself, it's a great thing, but it's not necessarily helping people because you can't assembly line teach this. Your problem's not the same as my problem. So I can't tell you two people the same thing. You might need this. He might need the exact opposite. Your wife might need a third. You can't just go do this and everybody moves along happily ever after. It doesn't work like that. Plus, everybody's built differently. You have extremely long arms, you know. I'm not sure how much hand-eye you have, but if you have hand-eye coordination at your height, you can smash it. You've never even hit one probably good before. You can smash it if you have good hand-eye with your levers and how, how tall you are. Oh, interesting. There's a lot of speed, and think about how much speed you can create with that. Yeah, yeah. with a big, long lever. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, your 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 wrists and, and elbows and things like that are and, just levers. And so you're saying that you think there have been a lot of people that have come in and been like, hey, you should pay me to to teach you how to golf, and then they don't, and then it goes poorly well, yeah, for them? I mean, Well, yeah, I mean, I've listened to instruction. I've listened to the Golf Channel. I've listened to some really famous people get on there and go, what? And so they make it so confusing, first of all. This is a simple game, man. It's a stick and a ball. Hit it. And until you hit it enough, like I would tell you, how am I going to start? I want to hear, hear some clubs, go to the range, and hit these balls. Hit them. I'll give you a grip because I think it's important to have the, your hands on the club correctly. But start hitting because you're getting feedback when you hit. You're going to get feelings. You're going to get sensations. And until you get that, you got nothing. You just have this obscure idea of how this game is played and that you're not very good. But you've got to start making this contact and go, oh, that one felt different. What did I do differently? And then you're going to want to try to repeat that. And as soon as you have that in your memory bank, we have some place to start. How would somebody know if they're getting bad teaching? They're not getting better. Okay. It's that simple. Unless you are absolutely horrendous athlete and you can't tie your shoes, you know, there's, there's ways to help people to try to get them better, you know. And not everybody is going to be able to do, you know, I tell most of the guys that watch PGA Tour players, don't watch them. I mean, watch them, but don't try to emulate them. Watch the LPGA players. They're much more relatable because you guys can't create the sort of speed that the, these modern tour players create so your ball distances and everything are going to be so skewed you're going to feel like ah this sucks you know but it's not fair these guys are that that they're they're so much better than like the best golfer you know let's say you go to where you know your father-in-law hangs out at his club or something and there's somebody that's a scratch golfer that means every time he plays he shoots around even par actually it means he shoots around what the course is rated which is probably one over par so every day he goes in there and he's pretty much looked upon as the best player in his course, at that course. I can go at my age and I can't hardly beat anybody anymore. And I could probably beat him somewhere between five and 10 strokes every single day. Really? Yeah. And then to the big differentiator, Vance, is that I'll, we can go to a different course that neither of us know and it's not going to affect me. He's going to fall apart. He's really good at a course that he knows. He knows the greens. He knows his hole. He knows what to do. Try taking your game on the road. Try taking your game on the road. Go to different grasses. Go to different sand. Go to sleep in a hotel. Oh, I slept like crap last night. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, you got to go play. You're trying to make a living. Oh, that's right. Okay. 
whole different ball game. And you got to, you know, you, you've got to figure it out. How does this grass uh, compare to the grass at home? Well, this is wiry. This is different. This is wispy. Oh, what about the sand? The sand is packed and we got to hit bunker shots this way. This is kind of hard and more like a rivery sand. I've got to, you know, I, got, I, I can't take as much sand because the ball won't come out. You get in there and practice, and it's like the school of hard knocks, man. You just get in there and you start figuring it out. And so if you have a teacher that happens to be from the country club that everybody knows because he's the best golfer at the country club, it could be that a big part of his advantage is that he's got the home field advantage, not because he necessarily knows how to drive. Right. right. Now, not all good players are good teachers, but I really think if you're going to be a good teacher, you have to have some ability to play. Oh, I you totally got I mean, to have some. Ability. I mean, like you, you got to relate that, that's, to that's, an, that's in every sport, right? Like if you're if you're going to teach people how to lift, you better be able to lift heavy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, you better you be able to do jiu-jitsu. You better yeah. you better yeah. have, you better know you better how to roll. Kick. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. It's 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 weird. My dad said some of the best hitting guys helped him with his hitting were not good hitters, but they could see what to do. But the point I think that we're making there is they were in the game. They played the game. It's, you know, you've got to, you, you know, how do you explain to Mrs. Smith when she gets nervous how to handle those nerves if you don't know what it's like to have this crazy amount of adrenaline running through your body and now you got to try to swing this golf club and hit this high soft shot when all you want to do is hit it as hard as you can because your adrenaline is saying, go, 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 go. How do you do that? So what you have to do, you have to learn how to do that. So uh, from being in high pressure PGA, you know, money on the line, reputation on the line, your ability to play next year yeah. on the line, what do you know about controlling anxiety? Oh man, breathing is just gigantic. Breathing is just gigantic. And what the most important thing is your mind is your most part. I don't care what walk of life we are. Every single dude and person that sat in this chair that talked to you, their mind is their best, biggest asset, 100%. doesn't matter what we're doing, how you think. The only thing they know about modern psychology that's for sure is you get what you think. Oh, that's good. You get what you think the most, you get what you spend the most of your time thinking about. You're thinking about fear and you're thinking about this sucks and oh man, I'm afraid of this and this might happen to me, the other shoe's going to fall. <sighs> Something's going to happen. But if you're thinking about abundance you're thinking about love. You're thinking about all those things on the positive side of that thing. Man, you're going to attract that kind of stuff. The law of attraction is huge. Do you and meditate? I, believe it. I do. And tell me about your meditation. It's crazy. I remember like 20 years ago buying this like meditation for dummies book, you know, and I was, I was realizing that when I was doing my mental prep before I played, I needed to be able to get a little more relaxed. I wanted to get into this a little more. So I started meditating. I had this one experience I'll never forget. I was I had my kids out with me and we were in a um like a like a summerfield suites or something, just some sort of, you know, middle of the range hotel. I had a couple of hotel rooms and I, I would go into the bathroom when the, you know and try to do my prep for the night before and I started this meditating. So I'd go in there and kind of make it a little dark. And I went on this crazy trip where I, I just went, I was floating and I was like observing and it was, I was, man, I, I, I've never, ever, ever been able to get quite back into it that deeply that I was that night and I miss it. Well, they say it was that. was so cool. So, so where'd you go on your trip? What, what was it? Oh, I don't even think that's where it was. It wasn't a destination. It was a state of mind. I was just, you know, what I saw, I, it was like I was observing my own life and just observing life in general. And I was just, and everything was cool, relaxed. It was, it was all going to work out fine. And, and it was just this state of mind that was, man, I, I went to the golf course the next day. I had the best day. I didn't play the best round I ever played. I did play well. But it was just like, oh, man. That, w that was cool. the crazy thing for me. So I started meditation, I don't know, not that long ago, maybe four or five months ago. And all of a sudden you start realizing, I'm noticing that the birds are chirping in a way that I would have just passed that by before. Yeah. Like it brings you a level of consciousness where you're saying, this moment right now is the only moment I have. The mm -hmm. one that was in the past is gone and I can't live in the future. Right. But that's something people can say, but until you've experienced right it on. in meditation, yeah. you don't have it. And and for me it's been uh it's been wonderful. So did you um did that, that level of awareness start increasing in other things? Like hearing the birds chirp is a great example. Oh, oh. Isn't it? Because you're like, wait a minute. 
that guy's been in my tree for probably three years, and I'm just now hearing him today. Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, like, uh, I'm just just in talking with us. Like, I have to remind myself. So one time, I um, I I did an interview uh, with a guy named Jordan Peterson. It, it probably may, may not, not mean anything to you, but I took him to the American Farm Bureau, and um, he was giving a speech. He's an exceptional orator. He's giving a speech, and I'm sitting right next to him. And he is so powerful that the only way that I could describe it was it was like standing next to plutonium. It, it was it was like he was a burst of energy that I had never felt before. And I had to be like, hey, stay present yeah. because this is a moment that's going to disappear. And you can't just be wrapped up in the fact that it is happening. Explore, be, yeah. be there, right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, and yeah. And once I had that experience, then that led me down the path of looking for, wait, there's got to be more to this trying to find present moments. And that's when I found meditation. And then from there, I continue to try and have like you talk about the, the, the kind of psychedelic experience in your bathroom. And I talk about it a lot of like, just reminding myself, I'm in this moment right here, because I can dwell definitely on the past and plan way into the future and forget that this present moment is the only one you have. Have you ever done any acupuncture? I have not. Uh Uh-uh. I've done that too, and I had some crazy experiences with that. Really? Just where I, I was, I wanted to meditate, and I had these needles in me, and I was cr- stormy, not not scary, just just like floating in the, and and I felt had that floating experience again, but it was just you know almost chaotic. It was it wasn't scary, but it was almost just like a whirlwind. I couldn't c- quite grasp what was happening it was really crazy i had that multiple times i I did these treatments for my back when i i told you when i was 50 i had back surgery and i really struggled with this recovery it was supposed to be simple and mine unfortunately wasn't but that acupuncture experience was really a cool thing too um one of the things that that meditation has led me to i haven't done it yet i'll be interested to hear if you have but i used to be kind of afraid of being alone and I don't mean like afraid of it. I, I used to go camping by myself, but I mean like not distracted. Yeah. And you know, they have these uh, sensory deprivation tanks. Have you seen these? I have. Have you done one? No. Uh, so I, I am now looking forward to go. Maybe maybe you and I could go do that sometime. Right on. Because uh, I, I have been, up until I started meditating, I used to think that would be the worst thing you could do to me is put me in a coffin size, you know, thing and then take away all the sensation. I'd be left with just my thoughts. But once you've done meditation, you're like, there's all these wonderful thoughts and I never you, get I'm, access exactly. to. Exactly. And there's abundance everywhere. I'm an abundant guy. Have you ever had an MRI? No. Uh-uh. Really? Uh-uh. Oh, well, it, it, it'd be one of these deprivation tanks on steroids because you're in a tube. And there's this, there's this crazy, you have headphones on, crazy loud noises as this... Uh, uh, magnetic renaissance. Get in here with the microphone. This mag- yeah. uh, sorry, this um, the MRI machine is doing its thing, and you're the the tube's this far from you. Oh man, that would freak me out. Oh man, I got to tell you, I had some of my best trips. Really, close my eyes, relax, and just go 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 out. And then, but there were times where I had to do some pointed, like I I, I would call it more like poignant meditating on certain you know things that would get me through it. And I could easily, I found myself easily being able to get lost in there. Those thoughts and those experiences and past experience and future, you know, and going like, oh, I was on the beach. This was so cool. Remember? And I just kind of go, yeah, I remember how the sand smelled. and Because one of the things that I read in meditation is the more that you can engage your senses. Can you feel the sand on your feet? Yeah, I can feel. Can you smell that sunscreen you just put on? Yeah, the ocean smell. Oh, you know, you start engaging more of those those sensory um, uh, components, and all of a sudden you're like, "This is a full body thing." You know, you're going from your head to your toe, and you're going, "This is, yeah, right on. This is pretty cool." I mean, that sounds awesome. I I started meditation with uh, with an app actually. So there's there's a guy named <laughs> Sam Harris, and he he's written all these books on meditation, but he has an app called Waking Up. And so you just flip it on and for 10 minutes, he's essentially like every, you know, 30 or 40 seconds, he reminds you like, Hey, have you drifted off now? Get back back here. And, and, uh, now I don't need it, but it was a really, really good on ramp. And once you have that, that's a tool that like people genuinely, genuinely do not understand how 
how much of their time is spent not in the present. Right, right. Oh, I'm still guilty of it. I wish I, I didn't spend as much time in the... Uh, I like to spend most of my time, in, if I'm going to get off the present, I'll be in the future. But sometimes I get kind of swallowed up on some of the junk that's still in my life from the past that I have to deal with. It's not pleasurable and kind of a pain. But um, yeah, I, I get it. It's really a... Probably, you know, I, I don't know, some folks might be listening to us going... These guys, are, are they like doing LSD? What are they talking about? <laughs> and, but what, what's really interesting is that um, you get a connection to your own life that you otherwise, I'll speak for my own, so you get a connection to what you're doing in a different way in your own life and go, where have I been? I mean, that's you know, where have I, where, what the hell did I just, where did I, what did I just do? You are describing it exactly, right? Like, and now that I've been doing meditation, sometimes I'll take a nap and then, you know, you wake up and you're a little bit groggy, but then I have that thought, you are alive. You won't always be alive, but you're alive right now. And it makes me be able to just pop up and be like, instead of going through all those phases where you're kind of tired, then you yeah. slump, yeah. then you're like, Wow! Yeah. Look at this room. Yeah. Look at look at how fortunate I am to be here. Look right. at a meditation was the, probably the most important thing to to cr- come across my path in the last year. Yeah, yeah. It's Maybe, awesome. yeah, really changed my life. Have, have you ever seen that commercial where that guy and his family he's like laying in his bed? His family come in and they give him a gift, and you don't know what this commercial is selling, right? They give him a gift and he opens it up and it's like. A cup of coffee. And he's like, oh, my God, this is awesome. A cup of coffee. I have a cup of coffee. And then his wife comes in and goes, look, and we have coffee. And she puts coffee in there. And they're like, this is awesome. So they run through these series of opening gifts and exp- re-exploring or re-connecting um, um, with everyday stuff. Yeah. I have a car. He goes outside. He's like, this is my car? You know, and it's kind of like, Pay attention. You don't have to be as lucky as we are, man. You know, you get out, you know, oh, I hate my car. You got a nice car. Look what the rest of the world's driving. You've got a you've got a car. I, There's so, people in India that don't even, you know. I was in the Peace Corps for for a time and was living in Kenya and I came back and uh, it was actually kind of sudden. I got sick and I had to come home early. So I remember I was in Amsterdam, which the the airport there is one of the nicest in the world, and I I'm leaning over to get a drink of water, and I and as soon as it touches my mouth, it's cold, and I haven't had cold water from living in Kenya, in in however long I was there, six months, eight months, something like that, and uh, and I was just like caught off guard, and then all of a sudden I panicked because I was like, oh my god, I didn't boil this, and because you had to boil all the water, right? right. So it was always warm, even right. if you got it from a cool source, you had to you had to boil it. And, uh, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, wait a second. You don't have to worry about any of the water that you drink at all again if you choose not to. Right. right? Unless I go drink from a stream. Right. As long as I'm in the Western world. Right. And, and being joyful about this, right? Because right. I just spent six months where every single drop of water I was worried about. Right. And we don't have that at all here. Uh, a similar story. I had a buddy that I played golf with from Namibia. Okay, and he came over and he played golf at college in the States and played on tour for a few years, a good friend of mine. And we were driving somewhere, and I said to him, um, hey, bud, so you grew up in Africa, and, you know, this is crazy dirt roads. You just told me about the way you grew up. And um, what is the coolest things in our country? What are the two coolest things in our country that we completely take it for granted? And he said, first of all, he said water. He goes, man, you got the, we got the greatest water. It tastes great, and it's so bountiful. It's plentiful. It's everywhere. You can ski in it. You can swim in it. It's just everywhere. And he goes, we don't have any. And I went, man, you know, think about that. You know, you go to Minnesota and go, we got water everywhere. Now, you know, we don't even care about lakes up there because there's so many. And then he said, your roads. He goes, we can't get where we want to go. You guys can get from here to wherever. You can go, you can turn near drive anywhere. Yeah, where I was in Kenya, the roads were uh, were all pretty good because there was an election coming up. Yeah. And that's when they that's when the guys say, Oh, hey, let's oh, go build go some through. roads. Yeah, but right. the years in between elections, there's you know, no you, roads. You think about that and you think about our country and what a phenomenal country we have. What a, what are these opportunities? You and I are hanging out here for a couple hours 
doing whatever the hell we want. We're talking about what we want. We have the freedom to do what we want. And you went, you were in the Peace Corps. I, you know, took different paths, but we got to take our path. We had our path. We didn't have to do one thing. We didn't have to do another. We were, we were able to choose. We so were free. You know, you, you were kind of, we're both kind of hitting on this idea of, uh, you hit a homeostasis, right? You hit this point where you're like, you know, the, the guy that is excited about his coffee, but we're, you know, we all have that cup of coffee. We all have that car. It's got to be true in golf where no matter how good you get, there's always this like, oh, I could be better. No you doubt. Know, I, could, I could be stretching. You never own golf. You just borrow it for a little bit. The best players in the world. Look at Tiger Woods. He didn't make the cut this week at the British Open. Oh, I didn't know that. No, I know you didn't. That's okay. It's good. No, but I mean, it's, it's, I think that's part of what is the allure. Is it, you don't know, you don't know what you're going to get. And so how as a, how as an athlete, if you're like, Hey, you know, I am trying to move my way towards being the best, Yeah. but I also have this philosophy of abundance and this, I'm present in the moment and I'm happy with what I have. Those two things seem to be dichotomies, right? In opposition yeah, but, of one but, another. But you don't spend your time, you can't spend your time thinking about being the best. You have to put a plan together so that in this present moment, when you go to work on some part of your game, you know that it, once I get better and better at this part of my game, it's going to move me to, it's a process. You get locked into these processes. I'm going to work on my putting. I know I can't hold every putt. No, nobody that's ever played has hold every putt. And I know I got all. I can. I just have to run through my pre-shot routine, and I got to roll that ball as well as I can. And if it goes in, it goes in. If it doesn't, I got to pretend like it went in. I got to tell myself that was a great putt, man. You had a great putt. I know it didn't go in. Doesn't matter. I'm just going to do that again. And that sucks when you go through a day and you're doing that all day long, and you're rolling these balls great, and they're just going right over the edge of the hole. They're lipping out. They're just doing everything they can to test you. And you just gotta you just gotta try to keep your resolve. What is it like to see these people that are high achievers uh, that that are now out playing golf? And you have this understanding of like, hey, you just you just got to be there. You're present. You should you should be happy. I mean, is it is yeah. it like you wish you could reach them? Like, oh man, like if uh, I'm respectful of everybody, and so I'm not gonna go up and go, hey, here, here, li- listen to me. Uh, but if they come and say to you know, hey, can you help me? I'm like. Let me just give you a couple of ideas. First of all, you know, dump a couple of stats on them. So facts are facts, right? It's not my opinion. It's not your opinion. It's a fact. And so that you can hang your hat on a fact. Now, if I say something like, you know, we're all, we're all just borrowing, renting the game. We're not all that good at it. But he's going to go like, man, whatever. You know, Pollyanna, I don't want to listen to him. That's not a fact. So you get different personalities you have to approach differently. Some guys are like, you know, hey, what's, you know, what's the secret? You know, and I'm like, well, the secret is there's no secret. And it's like, like doctors are great. So I go to cocktail parties and I can, at my stage in my life, Vance, I can go in, I could put like a green dot on a doctor and a red dot on a uh, accountant. Really? A, oh yeah. I can, the personalities are just, they're, they're beautiful because docs have, have been raised and taught and bred to think that if there's enough information, they can figure anything out, which is great when it comes to being, you know, if you need somebody to figure out your problems in your body, that's a great way to be, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that doesn't translate on the golf course. And every once in a while, I've had to say to the doc, like, look, you know, the, I can see he's like, you're holding out on me. You're not giving me all the information I need. If you could just give me a little bit more information, I could be as good as you. And that's insulting because I've spent my whole life doing this. Yeah. And I'll say, Doc, there's one component. All right, all right, I'll give it to you. I'll tell you what the component is. And he's like, <laughs> I knew it. I knew it was finally there, and I'm going to go, okay, it's here. here's what it is. Talent. <laughs> you just don't have enough of it. And he'll look at me, I go, I'm sorry, I just got to tell you. You can't read that in a book, and you can't just have that osmos from a video over into your bag. You got to have some athletic ability. It's a kid with a stick and a ball. It's like Wayne Gretzky with a stick and a puck. And, it, you know, Michael Jordan got cut from his freshman basketball team. I never forgot that feeling. He said in his little black book, I use that feeling to motivate me every day. You know, so 
that's the kind of stuff. And you just not, they, you just don't, and thank God, right? Because, I mean, what if somebody at 50 years old decided to pick up the game and they really could be as good as we are and we spent our whole life trying to be like that? It wouldn't be right. Yeah, we certainly wouldn't feel very fair. That's no, right. life yeah. wouldn't be fair like that. And, I, and the game's not like that. And you know what? Nothing's really like that. Right. I can come into your space and do what you do. And, oh, that, that looks pretty easy. I think I'll go ahead and, you know, do what he does. And in like three hours, I'll be as good as him. That's a bunch of crap. Well, you know, in my uh, world, so I, I go out and give a lot of talks. And uh, a lot of times young people will come up and they'll be like, hey, I want to do what, what you're you doing. Do, yeah. And my only advice for them is then go start giving talks. Because there's you the, the whole th- feeling of connecting with an audience and finding out what is it that they want to understand that you know uniquely or how can you share something with them. There's You can't read it in a book. You can't imagine your way to it you can only do it by going up to on that stage hundreds of times and doing what everybody says you got to fail and you got to succeed but but like you got to just do it okay so remember the first time you went up in front of what's the most number of people you've talked in front of oh a couple thousand okay cool so you talked in front of a couple thousand remember the first time you did that yeah so you're walking on that stage and you look up and you see what Oh, just lots of people. There's lots yeah. of lights yeah, and lots, lots of, of yeah. lots of nothing, right? Yeah, that, that's right, there. yeah. So, okay, so what was running through your body at the time? Do you, can you remember? Oh, so I mean, not yeah. what's running through your brain. What's running through your body? What are you feeling? What are you breathing? What's, like, is your chest pounding? Are you... Are, you, are your palms sweaty? Yeah. So I have the 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 unique thing that it, I don't get uh, too too nervous. I get a metallic taste in my mouth, and uh, and I get this kind of um, smile on my face that isn't it isn't a happy smile. It's just like <laughs> anxious energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think it's a lot of anxious energy, yeah. and it does not subside until. I get the crowd to laugh at one thing. Yeah. And I'm not a comedian, but once you get the crowd to laugh, then it then it's then then everybody knows we're all on this. We're together. on the same wavelength right. there. Right. Yeah, right. And so that 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 rises and rises and rises and rises until I can hit something with them. And if you don't, Ugh. then then the feeling Ugh. just ra- th- that's like, you yeah. know, shanking your first yeah, uh, right, your right. first uh, teeth. I've done public speaking before too, and that that you know did you ever go through the experience of trying to think about your words when you first started speaking? Meaning, instead of getting locked into your subject, like you know what you're talking about, and here's my program, and boom, I'm going into it. Instead, you were like trying to sound smart. Or did, did you ever... Exp- oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And how effective yeah. were you? Oh, bad. Awful, yeah, bad. Right? Bad. That's the same thing in sport, right? That's the same thing about trying to think your way through the sport instead of playing. Oh, that's good. You know, and I actually can make a comparison on that. I oftentimes do not know what my first story I'm going to tell is. It comes from whoever I'm sitting with right before I get invited. Usually there's like a dinner or there's something going on. And I will sit there and I always say, hey, the thing that you can do that's best for me is sit me next to the person that is the most talkative in your whole organization. <laughs> right. And then let me sit down next to them yeah. and, and let them talk. Yeah. And they're going to say something that's going to make me go... Got it. Yeah. And so how about that feeling? So explain to me that feeling that you had between, oh man, this sucks. I'm not connecting. I can't get that chuckle. I'm not, I'm, I'm just missing compared to boom. I got it. Oh, right out of the Yeah. Hop. There's, there's nothing. There's the, the, once you get it, I often describe it as surfing, right? It's, it's like feeling a wave pull you up and then getting to rock it down on it and it's it's pure ecstasy there is there is nothing on earth like it and and there's nothing like it for the audience either right they they feel that as well if you if you oh, lock in sure. they are just as happy as you are to have locked in and now we're now we're heading on a ride yeah so you're doing that and you're feeling that run through your body and now as you're running down a wave there's adrenaline running through you right there's yeah that's that similarity is like that in golf as well. You're getting this full body experience about doing something that is playing really good golf in front of a bunch of people when you're really nervous. Great feeling. Oh man, it's a great feeling. It's just like you. You did it, Jay. Person. You it's did like, it. Boom. You you got you made the connection on yeah. golf. Yeah. I uh, I did not. I would not have made that connection. That's yeah. very interesting. That's it. So you like that feeling of connecting with that audience and that first. You know that first comical moment, man. That's what we're. That's what we. That's what we feel. 
Wow. Yeah, that's a good feeling. We want to do that over and over and over again. Amen. Well, yeah. I tell you, the other feeling is uh, connecting with a guest and, and finding that you have a lot more in common. This yeah. has been absolutely great, Jay. I'm yeah, so glad too, you stopped yeah. by. Uh, thanks, and we'll thanks have for having you back me. again. So yeah, thank you sure. very much. Yeah, pleasure. That's it for this week's interview. I want to thank Jay Delsing for stopping by the studio. You can find Jay on Twitter, and he also has a great website, jdelsinggolf.com, where you can find out more about his radio show, and I think he even books some of his professional tours there. Thank you, Jay, so much for stopping by. One final note that I want to make before I clear out, I am so appreciative of all the reviews that people have given me on iTunes, the thumbs up and the subscribes on YouTube, and probably even more than that, the people that are commenting and and interacting with me on Twitter after I publish some of these episodes. There are two people this week that stuck out to me, and I just wanted to point them out. One is a man named Keaton Kruger, who, uh, following my nutrition um, podcast with Connie Dickman, has had lots and lots of back and forths with me, and I find his commentary, some of his insights, and his point of views to be absolutely uh, fun and entertaining, and, and, uh, and I'm glad that he reaches out. There's another guy named Dusty Rich. He goes by DRich82 on Twitter. He gave me a big shout out and we had a fun back and forth and I was just really appreciative that he took the time to do it. So if you are out on Twitter, make sure you give me a shout and let me know what you like about the show, if there's anybody you think I should interview and uh, anything I can do to make this whole thing better. So thank you so much for stopping by. We'll be back next week, hopefully with a banker, but we'll see if I can make this all come together. So thanks so much, and we'll see you next week.